Welcome to this short course on design control for medical devices. I'm Peter Sibelius and I worked with medical device product development for 20 years and have taken several medical devices from being ideas to having sales in both Europe and the US. In this short course, I will be showing you what design control is. I will be covering some important concepts that you need to know in order to be successful in the product development of medical devices. This will include things such as intended use, user needs, design input, design verification, design validation, and design transfer. This is a good starting point for anyone working with product development in a medical device company. The goals of this short course are that you should get a basic understanding of what design control for medical devices is and why you should care about it. Based on that, you should be able to figure out if the full course on design control that we offer could help you in your job or career. The full online course on medicaldevicehq.com is similar to this one, but much more comprehensive with more in-depth information and quizzes at the end of each topic to test your knowledge and understanding. You will also receive a course certificate at the end of the course, which auditors may sometimes ask for. So what is design control? Strictly speaking, design control is the name of the chapter in 21 CFR 820, or the quality system regulation, that covers requirements on how to do product development of a medical device when you're selling to the US market. Is understanding design control requirements important? It is if you want to sell to the US market because for most medical devices, design control requirements are mandatory to conform to. No design control, no market access. But not only that, if you're selling to the European Union, the same kind of requirements apply, but they can instead be found in chapter 73 of the EN ISO 13485 standard. Now that we have spoken briefly about what design control is, let's talk about why we should care about design controls. The boring answer to why we should care is that complying with design control requirements is a regulatory requirement. This is of course technically correct, but if someone tells you that you should work with design control only because it is a regulatory requirement, I think that that person has overlooked something very important. Working according to design control requirements is an effective way of creating products that are not only safe, but that will also satisfy your customers' needs. In fact, most of the design control requirements represent best practices in developing new products. And if you look at companies from other industries where design control is not a requirement, you will find companies working according to these principles anyway, because they see the value in it. So we can therefore conclude that learning about design control is not only about doing things in a certain way to gain access to the US and European markets, but it is to learn how to be successful in developing safe products that meet your customers' needs. And that can never be wrong, can it? Now keep that in mind during this short course. What you're learning are best practices and not only regulatory requirements. I think you should learn how to speak design control-ish. Now that might sound odd, but understanding the industry-specific language of the industry you work in is a very important thing. If you have a few years of work experience from other industries before starting with medical devices, you're likely to discover that medical device product development is not fundamentally different from what you have been seeing before. In fact, many concepts are the same, but what is most likely different will be two things. One, that we use different terms and names for things, and two, we're absolutely obsessed with risk management and safety. And by the way, there is a free short course on risk management as well on medicaldevicehq.com. In my experience, getting the medical device terminology right will help you a long way in understanding your colleagues and understanding your company's quality procedures. And these two things together should make life or at least your work life easier and make you more productive. I will be bringing you up to speed on some of these key terms that are used a lot. If you want to learn more about the things we are talking about here, they will all be covered in greater detail in the full courses that we offer at medicaldevicehq.com. The first term I will be bringing up is intended use. It is a good starting point because the intended use or intended purpose is something that you should have defined quite early in your projects. Let's start with an example to let you know what I'm talking about. This is an intended use for a thermometer. So this example is that the thermoscan thermometer is indicated for intermittent measurement and monitoring of human body temperature for people of all ages. It is intended for household use only. It's important to get the intended use right, because in the US, the intended use can decide if the product will be cleared under a 510K or require a pre-market approval, which makes a world of difference, both time-wise and cost-wise. In short, you can say that the intended use is a short high-level description of user profile, what indications the device is intended for, 
patient group and other relevant conditions of use as intended by you, the manufacturer. One way of coming up with an intended use is to answer questions like who will be using the device, on whom, for what, where, and sometimes when. If you answer these questions in a few sentences, then you will have defined your intended use. Not all intended uses will be fully defined and answer all these questions, but if you answer them all, you should have a good idea of what your intended use should be like. Now you know roughly what the intended use is. Let's look at the next thing that you should be defining at an early stage. I'm referring to the user needs. User needs should describe, guess what, what the users need. And they should be aligned with the intended use. A simple example for a user need is that the system should be portable. User needs should then be translated into design inputs, which should be abstract technical requirements that realizes the user needs when implemented in a design. In this case, we have said that to us, portable means that the weight should not exceed 10 kilograms. Someone else might arrive at another weight, and that might be true for that particular case. We simply do our best to come up with the abstract requirements that will solve or make the product work for the user according to the user needs. As you can imagine, getting the translation of user needs into technical requirements right is a really critical thing for the success and customer acceptance of your product. The regulatory requirements does not say who should come up with the user needs and design inputs, but uh, many times the people who are competent to define user needs are found in management or the marketing department, or typically they would be working with product management. Since the design inputs should be technical in their nature, they are usually established by engineering and should use engineering language. When you have designed a product, you should check that the design or product you came up with actually meets the requirements you defined at the beginning. This is a general principle in product development. In the medical device industry, it's a regulatory requirement to do it. If we use design control terminology, we would call this design verification and say that we need to confirm that design output meets design input requirements. In this case, the design input was that the device weight should not exceed 10 kilograms. The verification could be done by putting the device on a calibrated scale and weighing it. Now you may use many different methods for verification and demonstrating that your design outputs have met the design input, which methods you use are in most cases up to you to decide on. When you have verified that the product meets the technical requirements, you also have to check that the device meets the intended use and user needs. Because remember, a product may be 100% technically correct, but still useless in a real setting. To avoid that, you should perform design validation. It is a regulatory requirement to perform design validation, and it must be done by testing your device design in a real or simulated environment. When you do, you have to use production units or equivalent devices. Doing that does not only make perfect sense, it is also a regulatory requirement to do so. Looking at our example from before, with the portable product, we might let a few users carry the device and thereby concluding that yes, the device is portable. It is of course not always that easy to do design validation. Sometimes you cannot show that intended use and user needs have been met with anything less than a clinical investigation and use on real human subjects. What do you think? Is there anyone out there that checks that medical device companies are doing things the way they should? Yes. In the EU, each country has a supervising government entity for medical devices. In the United Kingdom, that would be the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, or MHRA for short. In Sweden, it would be the Medical Products Agency. In Denmark, it would be the Danish Medicines Agency. And in the US, it would be the FDA, or the Food and Drug Administration. The generic name for these organizations are competent authorities. When you sell to the European Union, you will in most cases never meet or even get in contact with the competent authorities unless something has gone very wrong with your medical devices. Because for manufacturers selling to the European Union, the auditing of medical device manufacturers is done by companies that have earned the status of being notified bodies. Your notified body will come and audit you once, twice or more times a year depending on your product and audit scheme. You are their customer and you will pay them for auditing you. It is with the notified bodies and the FDA you will be communicating to receive your market clearance and approval. In EU, that would be to receive the CA mark. In the US, you would receive an FDA clearance or approval, depending on which classification your product has and which market access route you have taken. 
Now you know several more new terms and concepts such as intended use, user needs, design input, design verification, design validation, competent authorities and notified bodies. This is all part of speaking design controlish. Let's take a look at the product development process using some of the terminology that you have learned so far. Projects should not start at random. Formally starting a project is usually referred to as initiation. It could or even should be a fairly short phase. A few days is usually enough to make the decision to start. The decision may very well be documented in a project charter. There are no formal requirements on initiation from a regulatory point of view, but you may find auditors and inspectors asking you when a project was actually started. An initiation and the signing of a project charter would be an excellent record to show just that. The next step is planning. Do you think it's hard to get the planning started? Maybe there is simply still too much uncertainty to make a relevant plan. If that is the case, you should consider running a pre-study before you start planning. There are many different names for this phase. It could, for example, be feasibility study or concept study. Whatever the name, the purpose is to decrease uncertainty to a level where it is appropriate to start a project under design control. Let's get back to the planning and a good piece of advice. Don't wait too long to get the planning started. This is a common mistake. When you do plan, the first question to ask yourself is what you were delivering from the project or what is the objective of the project? The answer to this should include the intended use, user needs and design input that we talked about previously. Using project management terminology, this would be to define the scope of the project, including the deliverables and the product requirements. Usually people in your organization will expect a project manager to come up with who will be doing the work and when. Many times the latter would be documented in a Gantt chart. The planning we have talked about so far would typically be carried out as part of traditional project management, but it is also required from a design control point of view. But then it's referred to as design planning. Lastly, you should define a budget. Having a budget is not a regulatory requirement because notified bodies and FDA should not care how much your projects cost as long as the devices meet their requirements in terms of safety and efficacy. After planning, the next step is execution and design. If you don't recognize the terms that I used uh, from your own processes and procedures, don't worry, different companies will use different names. But as a general approach, I try to stick to terms from standards and norms or what is most commonly used. Now, design is the part of a project that is easiest to relate to if you ask me. It is the phase that is focused on creating the design. It's always the first thing to do in the execution phase of a product development project. For a mechanical device, design would be to design parts and select components. For electronics design, it would be creating schematics, making circuit board layouts and selecting components. For software, the goal for the design phase would be to create the code. For a complex system, it would be to do all of the things mentioned and integrating them as a system. What should we be basing the design on? We should design the device based on the design inputs that were defined in the planning phase. When the product has been designed, you will need to show that what you did met the design inputs. This is called design verification. In design verification, you should provide objective evidence that your design outputs, meaning the design you have created, meets the design inputs or the product requirements to use another term. One way to show this is to test the device. From a regulatory point of view, you may do design verification on early prototypes, but beware, there is of course a risk that the products you will manufacture in in the first production will be different from your early prototypes. In fact, many times the early prototypes from the engineering department are performing better compared to the products that will eventually come out of the first production. Why? Because you had your best engineers built and tweak the first prototypes until they work like they should. And when those engineers are not around to do that in production, you might get a different result. This takes us to the next big area of work, creating the capability to manufacture the device in production. Setting up production for your medical device must be part of your plans. That is not only a good idea, but also a design control requirement. We can't leave that important element of product realization to chance. Now, I usually refer to this process or work package as design transfer. It includes areas such as supplier evaluation, designing the manufacturing process, buying tools, performing process validation, and acceptance by manufacturing. Some companies would use a different name for what I call design transfer and reserve this term for a ramp up of production after regulatory approvals. And there is nothing wrong with that. 
I mean, there is nothing that requires you to call certain faces certain names. It does, however, help to use commonly used names because it facilitates communication with regulatory organizations such as your notified body and the FDA. And that is worth a lot. When you have shown that your device is technically okay in the design verification and you have set up production, you should validate the design. The design validation should show that your product works like intended and that user needs have been met. Please note, design validation is not the same thing as process validation or usability testing. If you are the project manager and you are not involved in clinical investigations or regulatory submissions, you can close down the project. This would be an administrative closure of the project. Nothing required from a regulatory point of view. But let me ask you, do you think it's a good idea to learn what worked and did not work in your project? It is a good idea. Spend a few days working on lessons learned. When done, you can either see mark the device or proceed to do a clinical investigation and then see mark the device. If you're aiming for the US market, you would be seeking clearance or approval from the FDA through a pre-market notification or pre-market approval process. The project is at last over and the production department has taken over the responsibility. You should still be working with design control though, because in this phase, you should be using change control on any change that you need to do on your product. Also, you would be updating your risk management file and clinical evaluation report and other relevant documents as you learn from your products on the market. That was a whole lot of design control requirements and principles together with the project process. I hope that by now you know a bit more about what design control is. Do you need templates for more inspiration or knowledge on design control? Look for free templates relating to product development on medicaldevicehq.com or consider taking the full course Introduction to Design Control for Medical Devices on medicaldevicehq.com. We offer online courses, public classroom courses, as well as in-house training on risk management, design control, and project management for medical devices. Drop us a line on support at medicaldevicehq.com if you would like to learn more about the options or receive a proposal for an in-house course. Or email me on the same email address if you have a question relating to design control. Or share what you think is most challenging in design control. I hope to hear from you.